Ah, the Brooklyn Bridge, known the world over as a marvel of civil engineering, connects the boroughs of Brooklyn and Manhattan in the state of New York. The vision of German immigrant John Roebling, the Brooklyn Bridge began construction in 1869 and was to be the grandest bridge ever built, rising 276 feet above the water and nearly 100 more feet descending into the water and bedrock by way of an underwater caisson. 135 feet high, 1500 feet long, it contains hundreds of miles of cable. Today we reveal the amazing engineering that built what we now know as the Brooklyn Bridge. Prior to the construction of the East River Bridge, the river was passable only by boat, a bridge design that could remain structurally integral with the turbulent waters whilst not obstructing maritime traffic seemed like a pipe dream. Thankfully for the citizens of New York, one man would smoke the metaphorical pipe, Sir John Roebling. Roebling, a German immigrant with a background in engineering, amassed a small fortune by producing steel wire cable in his garage and would later be commissioned to design and oversee the construction of suspension bridges throughout these United States. Suspension bridges are designed to keep towers in a constant compression and cables in tension, allowing for large lengths of roadway without the need of support piers that obstruct vessels below the bridge, distinguishing them from bridges of eras prior. In 1969, Roebling began construction on a suspension bridge over the East River, spanning just over an imperial mile, with the longest section being 1,595 feet in length. The first major engineering challenge was building two piers into the East River that could support the towers. This required piers to be built into the bedrock under 70 feet of water and at least 20 more feet of sand and gravel. By this time in history, one prevailing method existed for underwater construction, a caisson. This method has been used prior to the construction of the East River Bridge, never to such a scale as Mr. Roebling intended. The East River caissons were constructed of airtight wooden chambers with no bottom. These structures would then be floated into the correct position and sunk into the riverbed where an air conduit would pressurize the workspace to approximately twice the standard atmospheric pressure to force the water to evacuate the workspace. From there, the workers would lower via a ladder into the workspace through an airlock where they then proceed to dig out the sand beneath the caisson by hand to cause the caisson to sink lower into the ground until the bedrock is reached and the caisson fairly settled upon it. To remove the excavated material, a system was devised to away with the sand and refuse excavated from within the caisson, where it may then be carried away by a dredge atop the structure. A New York Times journalist recounts his expedition into one of the East River's caissons. Very few people will fully comprehend the magnitude of the work that has been undertaken in constructing the bridge across the East River. When completed, it will be one of the grandest triumphs of engineering skill. A reporter of the Times recently visited the Kazon at the foot of the Roosevelt Street, which presents a scene of the busiest activity. Twelve air pumps, forcing air into the Kazon, were noisily at work, and two sandpipes were discharging volumes of sand which rushed through them with a loud noise. Two shafts afford access to the interior of the Kazon, and down one of these the party descended by means of the spiral staircase. At the bottom of each shaft on one side is a small oval opening just large enough to admit the body of a man, and closed by an iron door this affords entrance a small circular chamber about eight feet in length and six feet in diameter called the lock. At the bottom of the lock on the opposite side from the entrance is a similar opening closed in like manner opening into the Kazon which gives access to its interior. Descending a short ladder the party found themselves standing upon a narrow plank Walk out into one of the chambers of the Kazon and 70 feet below the level of the water into the river. The interior is divided into six chambers by massive partitions of wood and iron, with passages through them into each chamber. In all directions are laid narrow plank walks for the convenience of wheeling the sand which forms the bed of the river into discharge pipes. The chambers are about 8 feet in height and lined through with a thin plating of iron. This is to guard against woodwork catching fire. The sand excavated is forced out through the pipes by a simple pressure of the air. The pipes are about 4 inches in diameter and operate upon the principle of a siphon. The sand is wheeled from the different chambers to the pipes, and they are shoveled around them. The flow can be shut off at any time by means of a stop cock, worked by means of a huge wrench. The trips to and from the interior of the caissons were wrought with discomfort that requires one plugging their nose to create an internal pressure upon the ears, 
but also afflicted many workers with a mysterious disease then known as Cason disease, known today as decompression sickness, a result of nitrogen bubbles forming the blood which may result in a severe pain liking to a tearing of the flesh, or in more severe cases, paralysis or death. Due in part to the dangers and the high effort required to excavate the caissons, coupled with increasing costs in political rhetoric, you know how politicians get around election time, construction of the caissons was cut short. To this day, the Manhattan caissons still rest upon sand rather than solid bedrock. The caissons were to be filled with concrete and mason as construction continued in the overworld. Atop the piers built upon the caissons was erected two colossal gothic towers that support the weight of the suspension cables and the roadway. These towers, made from limestone and granite, reached 276 feet above the water level and gave the entire structure a weight of more than 93,000 tons. From the towers are suspended four 16-inch diameter galvanized steel cables, comprised itself of six-gauge steel wire threaded into a larger rope as you can see in this public domain image. Each cable has a strength of 169,000 pounds per square inch of section. Suspension cables transit between the towers by way of a guide rope and are adjusted to the appropriate length. Meanwhile, anchorages were constructed ashore that would equalize the tension on the tower from the center of the bridge. Cables leading into the anchorages were secured tightly into the masonry. With the suspension installed allowed construction of the roadway, which was constructed atop steel reinforcement, which rested 135 feet above water level. In total, the length of the Brooklyn Bridge consisted of 5,989 feet of roadway by length and 85 by width, 3,455 feet of which is suspended among the three sections. For comparison, this is equivalent to 16.5 football fields, 1,500 standard New York hot dog vendor carts, or approximately the distance that light can travel in 6 microseconds. Now that you are acquainted with these lengths and fairly familiar units of distance, perhaps you can appreciate the great efforts afforded to this project to be built entirely by hand tools in no more than 14 years after the project began, the antithesis of modern construction techniques. You'd be surprised how much you can get done when you're not moving orange cones all day. Do recall that this bridge was built not with the assistance of heavy machinery that is afforded today, rather entirely by tools in the hands of skilled craftsmen. Whatever the weather is shining or showery, that doesn't cut any ice on the bowery. Every night, till broad daylight, they dance and sing and talk. There may be no toll to get across, but there is a death toll. In the end, the construction of the bridge claimed an estimated 27 lives, including that of its architect, Mr. John Roebling, leaving the completion of the bridge in the hands of his son, Mr. Washington Roebling. The bridge was opened on Thursday, 24th of May, 1883, to the great expense of 15.5 million, discounting inflation. All of New York was in attendance, some even calling it the eighth wonder of the world, all doubts and concerns were swept aside as the bridge now opened to the public. Since then, the East River Bridge, now known as the Brooklyn Bridge, has been made integral for the transport of pedestrians, automobiles, and locomotives alike. It so happens that the work that is likely to be our most durable monument and can convey some knowledge of us to the most remote posterity is a work of bare utility. Not a shrine, not a fortress, not a palace, but a bridge. Oh, by the way, I purchased the deed to the Brooklyn Bridge from a gentleman named Mr. Parker a few months back. Mark my words, that bridge is going to be worth a lot of money someday. <laughs>